Welcome to this lecture on SQL scripts. We've been writing SQL scripting all along to compose our queries, but we're going to explore some of the procedural aspects of SQL programming uh, in order to do some additional work um, on uh, uh, SQL scripts. And this is going to parallel our assignment exercises. So you can use the techniques that are demonstrated here uh, to solve the similar problems that are assigned in the unit of study. Okay, so let's start with uh, this exercise, uh, which is uh, similar to your uh, exercise one. It says, write a script that declares a variable and sets it to the count of all products in the products table. If the count is greater than or equal to seven, the script should display a message that says the number of products is greater than or equal to seven. Otherwise, it should say the number of products is less than seven. So we can uh, go take our specification and start carving that up to um, create our solution. So we know that one case needs to say this and another case needs to say this. So we'll just kind of park those out there. We know that we're going to be working on the uh, My Guitar Shop So let's start that off. And then let's uh, start building this out. So um, we know that this is a decision structure here. Could be a case, could be an if. Let's build it with an if. And so if, and for right now, I'll just say some condition is greater than or equal to seven. That's our pivot point. Then we want to do what with this message? We want to print this message. And let's change these quote marks over to SQL single quote marks. And then in other cases, we want to print this message. And again, I'll convert that to SQL style quotes. And then uh, this sum condition, we need a variable. We put a placeholder in there for that. So we need to declare a variable for that. Um, declare and uh, preface it with an at sign and let's call it product count. And what would be an appropriate uh, data type for um, the number of products? Well, we probably don't have fractional products, so I'm guessing that's an int. Uh, if we wanted to go double check it, we could come in here into the um, uh, tables and take a look at the products table and take a look at the columns. And if we take a look, at the um, okay, this isn't an attribute, so we're not going to to type it the same as a product count. We're going to um, generate a count of that, and the count is certainly going to be a whole number. So that's going to be an integer. So yeah, um, int. So um, and notice that we we sort of end the batch with a. Uh, declaration of the variable. Now the variable has, the, the batch has processed by the time we get to the next line of code. So that variable will have an instance. It will be instantiated. It will exist in memory and then we can start referencing it. Okay. And then we need to get the count of uh, products from the products table and store it into that variable so that this can work and then we'll take some condition and we're going to replace that with at product count. And so how do we get the count of um, the products? 
Um, that's an aggregate function. You might be thinking group by right away. I like where you're going with that. But all we need is the count and it's it's for the whole table. So there's no grouping required. Select product count equals count. And think about this. Do we want count star or we want to count a field. I think we want count star in this case from products in the batch. Okay, so this makes sure by ending the batch here, we've got the uh, variable instantiated. We end the batch here. That means that at this point, we have a value in it, which is the count of the products table. So let's go ahead and, and just uh, uh, test that much. So let's use my guitar shop and let's um, uh, declare that variable and then let's check that. Okay. And so, oh, it says must declare it. So I probably have to run that all in one go. Yeah, okay. So that worked, it doesn't tell us anything. Um, let's do a sanity check on this. Select count star from products. And let's just see what we get. So there are 10, 10 products. So now we should be able to run our whole script. So the first phase, we've kind of broken it into bite-sized pieces. We use my guitar shop and we declare the product count integer variable. Then we populate that, should have the number 10 in it. And then if product count is greater than or equal to seven, it should be 10, right? So it should be, it should be more than that. So um, it should be true that it's greater than that. And we should see this message printed. This message should not be printed. Okay, so let's run that and see if that works as expected. And there's the printout. The number of products is greater than or equal to 10. Okay, so um, just to feel comfortable that we're, that's working, let's see if we can uh, uh, change that path uh, so products is less than, well, what if I said 100, okay? So let's say um, uh, that products is equal to 100. So let's, instead of populating that variable this way, let's say, at product count equals 100. Can we do that that way? Do we need to, we need to set? See if that works. Oh, got to declare it first. Okay, so let's declare it and run it. It likes that. So now let's run the whole thing and we're artificially inflating the, the count to 100 and the number of products is greater than or equal to seven. Uh, and we wanted to find less than seven. So let's change it to, what if we made that to one? So now we should test the alternate path. Number of products is less than seven. What's if, if it's exactly equal to seven, what should happen? Greater than or equal to should give us that one. So we can set that to seven and execute this and it says, greater than or equal to seven. So our logic looks like it's working correctly. Now we can go clean this up. We don't need that, that we put that in for testing. And run the whole thing again, and we're getting the expected result. So we've exhaustively tested and solved that exercise. Very good. Okay, let's take a look at our second parallel exercise. This one says,
write a script that uses two variables to store one, the count of all the products in the products table, and two, the average list for those products. If the product count is greater than or equal to seven, the script should print a message that displays the value of both variables. Otherwise, the script should print a message that says the number of products is less than seven. Okay, so I can see that we're, we've got a couple things to do in our queries. Let's start with, with just writing simple queries to give us the pieces that we need. So we want the count of all products in the products table. Select count star from products. And there are 10. We kind of knew that from our previous exercise. And then let's take a look at the next thing we need. Select, and we need the average. Um, average list price from products. And that's $841.89 and a half cents. Now we can combine these two like this for a little efficiency. We don't need separate queries for that. Okay, so there are both the values. Now let's think about what we need to do with them. So we're gonna need to store those var values in a couple variables. Um, so let's, uh, um, uh, well, and for form, if we were running the script from scratch, let's go ahead and put the statement in, use my guitar shop. We're already using it, but that way, if you just were opening that this script and running it from scratch, it'll be so totally self-contained. No, no one has to set up the environment ahead of time. So that's probably a good practice. And then we're going to need a couple variables: declare something and declare something else. And uh, let's see, we need to store the product count. Let's just call that product count. And we've already decided that should be an integer and then declare at list price average. And um, let's think about that. It, we can be partly informed by what was the data type of list price. If we go and find list price, it's money. And the average um, uh, is, yeah, a money will, money will work for that. So let's make this a money data type. And now let's populate our variables. So we want at product count to equal count star. And we want at list price average to equal average list price. So that's going to take the query we had already built and uh, use it to populate our variables. So now we've got our variables ready to go. And now we need to parse our requirements again and say, what are we going to do about this? Okay, so um, there's one condition. Um, and that is if the product count is greater than or equal to seven, then we're going to do some stuff. And then else, we're going to do some other stuff. And then we're going to end the if block. OK, so what goes in for the stuff? So we've got uh, uh, essentially what we're going to want to do here is uh, print some information. We want to print uh, the product count and uh, 
this is going to be the product count, but let's we we need to um, ideally um, cast this in or convert it into uh, a string uh, from an, uh, what it is now, which is um, a integer type. So let's do it number of ways we could do that, but let's do it this way. Let's use a convert. Uh, so let's convert to bar char at product count and let's also print the, this message list price average and same drill let's convert to a bar char the list price average and let's make sure that that matches okay and let's put this in a begin and end block and the uh, indents are not um, important to the computer they just for human beings make it a little bit more readable and we've intellisense is telling me i misspelled the variable name instead of at product at product count count okay good now let's take a look at our if clause and in this case so if it's not greater than or equal to seven um i don't need quite that many things i really only need to do um one thing let's have a begin and an end block. And what let's do here is let's print and the message will be the number of products is less than seven. All right, so do you follow all that? Let's see what we did. So we're using my guitar car shop. We set a couple variables, one to hold an integer, one to hold money. Then we set those. The integer one's going to be the count of uh, products. And then the um, money uh, integer or money, money variable list price average is going to be the average list price from the database. So we then set those values. And now we're going to do a little bit of logic on it. So if the product count is, is um, seven or more, then we're going to tell you what the product count is and list price average. If it's less than, than seven, um, we're just going to say, hey, the, the number is really too low to worry about the average. There's just seven in the database. So um, we'll just print the message. The number of uh, products is less than seven. Let's see if we've got this correct. Okay, so we know there are 10 and the list price average is 841.90. We uh, validated that previously when we tested our query. And so that's all looking good. Um, and now, um, if you wanted to artificially test the other branch of logic, we could do this here. We could take our query that's populating those variables. And uh, let's just uh, say um, set at product count equals, let's say, two and set at list price average equals um, uh, 1.99, okay? And uh, let's test that. So this should just print this message as our expectation. So we're testing that other branch. We already tested this branch because the actual data, excuse me, this branch, because the actual data here 
um, did re result in a product count more than seven. So let's run this. And it says the number of products is less than seven. So good. So we know that that branch of our logic is working. We can now get rid of the test. Set it back to our actual code. Let's run this again. And we're getting the product count and list price average. So that's all working the way we'd expect. Problem solved. Nice. So problem number three. All right, so this says write a script that calculates the common factors between 10 and 20. To find a common factor, you can use the modulo operator. Remember, the modulo operator is um, going to do the division, but it's not going to return both the quotient and the remainder. It's just going to give us the remainder type, and we're going to be looking for um, if it divides evenly, we want the remainder to be zero, right? Okay, so if it divides in and becomes zero, then it's a, it's a common factor. Okay, so check whether a number can be evenly divided into both numbers, then the script should print lines that display the common factors like this, common factors of 10 and 20, and then it prints each of them in turn on a new line. Okay, so probably the only really tricky thing here is the math. You may have to think about that uh, a little bit, and you may need to read up on the modulo operator to see exactly what that is doing for us. Again, it's returning, doing a division, but it's returning just the remainder. And what we're checking is we don't really care about the remainder other than we want to make sure the remainder is zero. If the remainder is zero, then it divided in evenly, okay? So when, it, when a, a modulo is zero, that means that one number went into the other number an, uh, an even, you know, or a whole number of times, okay? So let's, uh, let's see here. We're gonna need um, some variables. So let's have, um, start off with using my guitar shop. Good form to assume that the user doesn't have to set up the environment before the script runs. And let's have um, some variables. Um, one for the value 10, one for the value 20, because we need two variables. Let's just call those X and Y. And then let's have another variable we're going to use to check uh, whether it's a common factor. And we'll just call that I, okay? So let's declare um, X as an integer. And I'm gonna copy that two more times. And then I'll just edit it. And let's have a Y and let's have an I, and they're all integers, okay? And then let's uh, set X equals 10, and I'm gonna set the next two variables as well. And this is kind of trivial because we're hard coding the, uh, the, the variable values. Um, if this is like we're developing something for further use, when we get this really fully developed, we would be, of course, not hard coding these values, we would be get, gathering them from some input user input or um, something that we glean from the, the data itself, okay, the value of a field or something like that. But this is just kind of to um, learn a little bit and, and get a handle on how we might use these scripts. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, 10, 20, and uh, 1. And we're going to say uh, uh, we want to print that header. We need to, to print this message. So let's just go copy that message and print 
common factors of, and uh, uh, you know, we, we could hard code it this way and say 10 and 20, because we're gonna hard code the, the entry, but let's be a little bit more forward looking for when those variables could have different values. And let's go ahead and convert to varchar. If you program in other languages, you'll see we're using varchar instead of string. It's a the SQL data type that's essentially equivalent. Uh, and we're going to convert x. And again, the plus signs here, remember, are not addition. They are concatenation. They are building the string. They're sticking the string elements together. Um, and convert to varchar y. Okay, so there's that's going to print this header that we want printed out. Common factors of, and then x is 10 and y is 20. So it'll say common factors of 10 and 20. Nice, so what's the next thing we need to do? Okay, so we need to go through um, and uh, uh, iterate through all of the possible uh, numbers uh, between the um, the range that we're testing, um, in order to uh, see if if any of them have a modulo result of zero, and if the modulo is zero, then that's that one's a keeper. Then we're going to print it because it's a common denominator, right? Okay, so um, let's work from the innermost part of this structure out. So if we find a winner, what we want to do is we want to print convert to varchar i so this is what we do if i is a winner now i is currently one but we're going to step that through to find every possible um uh, divisor, right? And so how are we going to do that? Well, let's wrap this whole thing in a begin and an end block. And then we need to test something here. So if, and what is our test to determine if it is modulo zero, which is to say it is a divisor, okay, and a, a, a common factor, okay. So if y, and here's the modulo operator, this does the modulo division. If y modulo i equals zero. Now that's just the first half of it because that means it's it's a factor of um, y, but we also need to know is it a factor of x. So if it is and also, so and x modulo i, and get the case right on the variable name, equals zero. So if it is, if, if we divide y, y by, by the current value of i and x by the current value of i, and both of them have no remainder, then it is a, a factor of both. It's a common factor. Uh, isn't that clever? Okay, you might need to chew on that a little bit and kind of play with that to really see how the modulo operator is working. Okay, and um, then we're going to set i equals one more than it was. So uh, at i plus one, and then we need to iterate through this whole thing. So um, 
this needs to go from one that we started at and then two and then three. How far do we need to go until it gets to X, right? So to, for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So let's go ahead and uh, fix that. How do we get it to iterate? We make it a loop while I is less than X. And you know what? This begin block needs to be in here. And now you can really see why indenting helps to make the code a little bit more readable. Okay, so we're going to print out the header and then we're going to go into this loop and we're going to loop um, through all the values from 1 through 10. And we're going to check if it's a common factor. And then if it is, we're going to print it out on a new line. Okay, so that should give us one, two, five, and uh, um, let's do this. And I see something, I'm, I'm working along with the uh, uh, textbook author's uh, guidance on this, but 10 is a, is, a, is a factor of 10, and 10 is also a factor of 20, isn't it? But when did we stop? We stopped one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So let's let's do it the textbook author's way and then let's check it again and see if we can maybe improve on that a little bit. Okay, and I've got a syntax error in line 19 near a comma. So, There's a comma there. Okay, common factors of 10 and 20, one, two, and five. And again, we're stopping here. Think about this is, is I less than X. What if we made that I less than or equal to X? Yeah, so um, I would suggest that 10 is a common factor of 10 and it's also a common factor of 20. So this is actually the correct logic that we want there. Um, so I will make a note of that and update my notes. Uh, hey, we caught the, the uh, textbook author out in an error, yay. All right. Number four. All right, so this one says, write a script that attempts to insert a new category named guitars into the categories table. If the insert is successful, the script should display this message. Success, record was inserted. If the insert is unsuccessful, the script should display a message something like this. Failure, record was not inserted. And then it's going to go and return to us the actual system error, the standard error um, that uh, the SQL server is reporting. 
And in this case, it's going to be violation of unique key constraint, UQ, et cetera, whatever the, the um, key constraint was, cannot insert duplicate key and object and the rest of that stuff. Now, we don't have to code all that. We just need to know how to call the standard error um, or capture it and then uh, pass it on to the user. Okay, so um, let's take a look at what we need to do to do that. So again, best form, use my guitar shop. And this is gonna introduce a new structure um, that you haven't uh, used before perhaps. Um, and it is the try and catch structure. And basically what the try and catch structure does in programming is try says, do the following. However, if an error is encountered, then rather than just crashing the program because the error is not handled, when, when an error happens, don't panic, go over to the catch routine. It catches the error and it's gonna take care of the problem for us. So you don't have to crash the, the computer, you don't have to crash the program, or you don't have to fail over to some arcane default message. We wanna give you a, a more meaningful message. And ideally, having anticipated that an error might happen, we're gonna handle it gracefully and allow the program to resume and do other processing and, and not you know, have everything come to a screeching halt. Okay, so we're gonna have a try and we're gonna have a catch. And the try has a begin and an end. So we start with a begin try, and then somewhere later it ends the try. And then same thing with the catch. We begin the catch, and then we end the catch. All right, so what's our try? What are we trying to do? Well, we're going to attempt to insert categories category name values and let's say guitars. So we're trying to create a new category, guitars. And if that works, let's go ahead and print success. Record was inserted. And let's indent this for a little more readability. Okay, so we attempt this. And if that works, that's all great. We get this, this happy message. But if it does not work, then what do we wanna have happen? Okay, so if it does not work correctly, the first thing we wanna do is print the message that was required. Failure, record was not inserted, but we need to give a little bit more information than that. And here's where it gets um, a little bit heady because we're going to compose a string. It's print error, and then we're gonna convert to a varchar the error number that was received back from the system. Okay, we know there's an error number that's been provided by the system because otherwise this catch would not have been invoked. It's only been invoked because try failed. Okay, so we know if, if that try failed, it, a system error has been generated. So we're gonna give you the, the error number from the system. And we're also going to give you the error text from the standard error message. Okay, so that's where all of this highfalutin um, commentary came from, the system generated it. Um, we're giving you a little friendly explanation of what happened. It's like, hey, the record wasn't inserted and here's why. So the user probably needs to know this. And then when the user reports the message to the help desk, the engineer needs to know that. 
Okay, so we're making it both friendly to the user and useful to the, um, uh, the, the help desk or to support when an error is encountered. So let's try this and see if it works correctly. Okay, so it failed because violation of unique key constraint, UK category, cannot insert duplicate. So we already have guitars in there, right? And, and we can double check that and see that that's, that's why if we say um, uh, select star from and uh, uh, it's categories, right? My guitar shop categories, star from categories. If we run that, we see that sure, guitars already exist. Um, so we don't have tubas, right? So what if we were to change this from guitar to tubas, we would expect to see that the record um, inserts correctly. So that's great, record was inserted. And now if we go and look at it, Uh, we have tubas. Now we really don't want tubas, so we should probably say uh, delete from categories where category name equals tubas and fix things up there. Look star from categories. And we should see our tubas are gone. So we cleaned up our mess, right. But we should, putting our co code back to specification, get a failure. And it tells us that the record was not inserted. And it gives us a system message explaining why was that failure encountered. So very good. And those are our four parallel exercises for this lecture. I uh, hope you find that useful. Good luck on the assignment.